listening to Shop Talk with your host, Kevin Tates. Brought to you by Eastwood Tools. Everything you need to do the job right. Hey guys, you're listening to Shop Talk. I'm your host, Kevin Tates, and we're brought to you by the Eastwood Company. Do the job right with Eastwood. Well, I'm not going to babble on about an introduction for the next guy because he needs no introduction. Uh, Eddie Paul is with us. Eddie, how are you, man? I'm doing good. How are you doing back there? We are doing great. Tennessee has had a weird, weird, weird weather winter. I know you guys have also in, in California, but it's gone from like mid-70s to to uh, like the 30s and stuff like that within a few hours' notice. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I, I actually almost had to not wear a T-shirt to work today. It was getting a little nippy out here. But, uh, yeah, rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are no stranger to weird weather patterns, El Nino and, and all that kind of stuff that comes through there. But uh, I spent a little bit of time out in California a long, long time ago when I was uh, starving in the music industry. And I love the vibe. I love California. And uh, for our listeners, where are you in the state of California? Oh, we're right next to LAX Airport. We can literally see the airplanes land from my shop. So it's it's really convenient if we do a lot of traveling. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, LAX, the, uh, they, they kind of do a sort of a buzz pass over, over the inter- interstate, don't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it buzz past over our house, too, sometimes, which is a little scary. We don't know if it's a bird <laughs> quick or an airplane coming in for a abrupt landing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, very cool, man, and uh, congrats on being able to stay in California. I know it's, it's somewhat of a challenge as far as technology and industry. I've got several friends with manufacturing facilities out there, and, uh, you know, California is, is first and foremost with uh, regulations and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, but I guess there's a trade-off. What a, what a cool place to, to be stationed out of. Oh, yeah, the weather's just absolutely great, I and mean, we can work all hours around the clock if we need to, weekends. Um, yeah. We don't have to worry about well, that, not only there that. is a lot of regulations. OSHA is in here like weekly, it seems like. We get hit with yeah. tax, every fee, everything. So it's getting harder and harder to do stuff out here, but we're still hanging in. Yeah, well, I worked at a restoration shop uh, down in, uh, just off Venice Beach in, in the mid-'80s, I think 80, 86 or 87. It was a shop called Alejandra Porsche, and, and we were regulated. We couldn't wet sand. We had we couldn't water sand clear coats or anything and have it go down into the drainage. So it's it's nothing new. Uh, it's been it's been a long time. And I guess, you know, you got to be proactive with uh, dangerous chemicals and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a discussion for another time, whether it's uh, overreach or, or, or whatever. But uh, anyway... Uh, great to have you on Shop Talk. I don't even know where to start, man. I mean, I've, I've got your resume. I've done some Google searches. I know of you, of certainly before this interview. Um, let's start at the beginning. As a child, what what really inspired you? What made you get into all this technical stuff? What drives you, and what drove you as a kid? Well, I guess that would be my dad. Uh, he was an inventor. He invented a lot of things. He's the one that invented threaded rod. Came up with the idea of continuously threaded rods. You can cut it off to whatever length. He's the one that put the rotisserie chicken in the supermarkets, came up with that idea, so you could smell it cooking, and um, it would encourage you to buy ch- uh, fried chicken. He, um, he did a lot of things. So he would invent something, uh, build a company to manufacture it, and then he would sell the company, and we'd move. So we moved every six months, so it was really hard to make friends with anyone. So I picked up the uh, mechanic ability from him, and I was interested in cars. So about the best friends I had were in the auto body shops, when they used to have auto body shops in school. And mm-hmm. I'd uh, work on cars, and then on weekends or evenings, I'd work at home. I'd start pinstriping, painting signs, doing just about anything to make money. And it was almost all car-related or motorcycle-related. So I really didn't have much um, choice. It was kind of in our blood in the family. Yeah. Isn't that interesting how it's sort of a DNA thing? My brother and I are both automotive, and my dad was automotive as well. And, and uh, you know, my brother's a heavy-duty uh, mechanic up in the mines in Northwest Territories operating the big machines, and uh, actually he's a foreman now. But uh, it's just, it's in you. It's in our blood. And uh, I want to go back and thank your dad for all thread and rotisserie chicken. So uh, <laughs> both things are, are necessary in my book. But... Um, so kind of like uh I don't know I uh, forgive the term but kind of like uh they they call them uh, navy brats but it's it's kids that are with parents in in the services that are restationed and redeployed and stationed everywhere else you kind of learn how to to make your own way to forge your own alliances and also for me I was kind of like that too with a different set of circumstances we moved I think 13 times before I was a teenager so for me personally what that did is it taught me to look inward uh for a lot of different things as well as uh in 
inspiration and just kind of ideas. So would you say that that, uh, that helped you or did it make you a social recluse? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't because um, I don't have a lot of real friends. I have a lot of associates. So we've learned the value of real friends. We have a few good friends that will do anything for you. Um, so I think I've just learned to, to depend more on myself and, um, of course, my wife. We, we do everything together. We build houses together. We work on cars. Um, she's a big part of this. In fact, we're writing a book right now, and we're, we're co-authoring it, which is kind of neat. So um, you just uh, learn to depend on a very few people that you can depend on. And it um, inspired me to read more. I do a lot of artwork, so I, I just do stuff that doesn't rely on other people. I was never into sports, never cared anything about football, baseball. Uh, but I did like wrestling. I like the one-on-one -on -one where you're responsible yeah. for the outcome. You either win or you lose. You're not dependent on a teammate that yeah. loses for you. So I, I, it, it makes you different. Um, I don't think it's antisocial or anything. could be. No, no. I was just kind of being silly about that. But uh, – and, and – and... <laughs> Like you, my wife is my best friend, and she's my sounding board. She's my business partner, and and she's the one touchstone that I have of somebody that will be completely honest with me. So I'm I'm very glad to hear that you have somebody like that in your life too, because it's it's important, man, to have people that are real and grounded and not afraid to tell you the truth, isn't it? Yes, it is, and it tones down some of the harebrained ideas you come up with sometimes, <laughs> bring them down to reality. And say, you don't really want to do that, do you? <laughs> Excuse me. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump around a little bit because there's several things in your in your resume and, and uh, things that I, I know about you uh, that that I'm, I'm really curious about. So forgive me for going all over the map, but um, let's talk about aviation, hang gliding. Uh, I'm I'm an adrenaline junkie, but I've never um, honestly I've never had the balls to try hang gliding, and and it didn't end so well for you. Tell me about your aviation experience, and and um, if it's if, if it's okay, uh, tell our listeners about you know your your stint in the hospital after the accident and stuff. Okay. I um well of course I live in Los Angeles. That's kind of where hang gliding started. They used to have the polyethylene the plastic uh, sheets. Uh, wings on the hang gliders, and they're called Regalo gliders. And you take some, they start with bamboo. You take bamboo strips and you put plastic on top, made a delta wing glider, and jump mm -hmm. off a sand dune or a cliff. So we kind of advanced it because being an inventor, like my dad, I came up with a better glider. They would fold up into a small package, and we put background sails, and we started advancing hang gliding. Uh, and when you do that, you experiment a lot. You make, you know, you build the glider so light that it finally breaks and you go back to a little bit stronger. And you do the testing, low altitude and all that. Um, anyway, I uh, flew out here, did all, I had all kinds of gliders. We were selling them, making a pretty good living at it, working out of my house. And to cut to the chase, um, I'd been manufacturing gliders for about five, six years, and then I made one really lightweight um, that I was testing. I wouldn't sell it, but I was testing it. And I went down to the Torrance Beach, and it was a real high wind. It was 60-mile-an-hour winds. We had a windstorm here. And a couple people had crashed that I didn't know before I got there. I mean, I didn't know they crashed. And everybody there, because it was competition, were egging me on to test my glider. I said, I bet you can't handle this kind of wind. And I was young and stupid. And I thought, well, I'll give it a try. I can always land. Um, got to the top of a 100-foot cliff, leaped off, and went up 250 feet almost immediately like a freight elevator. And then the wind stopped, and the hang glider's weight shift. So I was pulled forward on the control bar trying to get the nose down to lose altitude. And when the wind stopped, it threw me into a vertical dive. Then the wind picked up, hit the top of the sail. And when it does that, the gliders aren't designed for that, so it snapped the, what they call the main spar. And that's also where you hooked into the hang glider. So, of course, right. I um, fell out of the hang glider 360 feet, hit the ground. Ow. Um, Ow. Should have died. As my dad said, a fall would have killed a human. And then... Um, <laughs> And oddly enough, paramedics were right at the cliff because they're watching some surfing events. There's some crazy surfers out there in the water, and we're right on the beach. So they saw the, gl the glider crash and ran down to get me out of there, took me to the hospital. And again, long story short, it's, uh, I was in six months in uh, Harbor General Hospital. I had a busted pelvis, uh, ruptured diaphragm, six organs hemorrhaging, concussion, broken back, broken legs, uh, broken feet, pretty bad shape. Then I got a pulmonary embolism while I was in there. They had me in a sling, so I'd never walk again. If I walked, I'd limp real bad. Um, I got through it, six months in the hospital, six months in a wheelchair, and started building a jet-powered hang glider as soon as I got well enough to move around. Unfortunately, my wife came out and put an end to that, <laughs> so I didn't <laughs> power the hang glider. Well, 
Let me ask you something philosophical, if it's even that type of a question. Uh, a lot of people talk about coming back from a traumatic injury with a renewed sense of, of the amount of time that we've got here on this earth. You know, I mean, the, the, the saying is, and it's not mine, but I subscribe to it, is nobody gets out of here alive. So oh. did that inspire you to, to – or did it give you a renewed sense of energy to, to go forward? Because let me tell you, I mean, reading your resume, I thought I was a multitasker, and you go way over and above. You know, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your butt or nothing like that, but, but you go way over and above what, what normal people would have been satisfied with, with achievements, and, and it's just impressive. So did, did that accident and that you know, arguably near-death experience have uh, any influence on you and your inspiration. I think it did. You definitely rethink life. And, you, you know, I keep thinking, if I would have died then, <clears throat> what would I have left behind? I mean, who would even know me or anything? Have I made an improvement in the world? So I started um, with a new attitude of getting as much done in my life as I can so that when I do die, and we all do do die eventually, um, that I left a history behind that people say, wow, he did this. Like I talk about my dad, threaded rot. I mean, everybody knows what that is. He left a mark. Yeah. He did a lot of things like that. And I want to do that. So when you do you know, do die, you say, well, I've left this behind, I had good morals, he treated us right, he paid his bills, he did all this nice stuff, and, and people look up to you like a role model instead of some um, crazy musician, you know, with tattoos and piercings everywhere that does drugs. Kids shouldn't be looking up to them, they should be looking up to people who accomplish good things. And so I guess it did. Uh, it also got me to never fly ink gliders again. So I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I always call that the day I dropped out of hang gliding. And uh, when I got well enough to, I, I literally on the resume, I got into stunt work, which is a whole lot safer than hang gliding. Interesting, interesting that stunt driving and, and uh, gaffing and stunt work is is uh, is safer than than hang gliding. But you know, I don't know. I, I would argue that skydiving is right up there too. But it, that's another thing I've never done. But uh, I figured out it canceled my life insurance, and then I think my wife would be pissed if, if that happened. So. Um, a quick question that comes to mind. Uh, with all the stuff that you've done, uh, are you an engineer? Uh, no, I never even graduated high school. I went to the 11th grade and then had to drop out to make money. Because at, at uh, 11th grade, I was on my own, living out of a garage that I rented. Um, and I was painting cars and working on motorcycles. I would have loved to have got, gone on, but I just couldn't afford it. But um, no, I uh, just sell well, I, I I a lot that, of books. I have a library here that... Uh, a lot of engineers would love to have. It's on everything. I studied physics and you know electronics and pneumatics and um, you name it, hydraulics, and we work with all that stuff. But one of the things you brought up is the diversification. One thing I like to explain on that is I think one of the reasons I'm so diversified in the type of work I do is because I don't like to say no to anybody. So if somebody calls up and says, can you build a shark? My first response is usually, sure, no problem. Um, can you build an airplane? Yeah, I think so. And I take a yeah. week or so to study up on it. And it's not that hard. So um, we built mechanical horses, uh, submarines, swimming sharks. We did a lot of stuff for uh, Discovery for Shark Week. In fact, I just finished yeah. a big project for them. Um, just well, about I, I definitely want to ask you. I definitely want to ask you about your experience with the Cousteau team and, and the animatronic sharks and stuff because that's something that really inspires me and as, as uh, oh, it goes way back for me on on a uh, on a genetic level as far as that goes. But and I definitely want to talk about that subject uh, in here just a little bit. But the reason I ask specifically, are you a degreed engineer? Uh, it. it I think there's a focus in this country, at least from the top down, on the on the need for a formal education. And I'm not discounting that, Eddie, or anybody listening. I'm not I'm not poo pooing that away whatsoever. But I think people have lost sight a little bit on what you can accomplish through self motivation and through a humble sense of work ethic and and a sense of that we don't know everything and we've got a lot to learn. And it sounds like that's exactly the the recipe that you've had with uh, your experience, but most importantly, your successes in life. And and I can relate to that a little bit, certainly not on the scale that you did, but but I think it's important for people to realize that somebody such as yourself, you're a very accomplished person, uh, you're obviously well-spoken, you are an educated man, although you don't have degrees on the wall. So I just want to say congratulations for busting that paradigm, if you will, and maybe in some small way we can remind people that the degree on the wall is not quite so important as as uh, the work ethic and and some a little bit of internal fortitude and motivation. Uh, I think that's maybe lost in today's society. Would you would you say that's a little bit accurate? 
Yeah, I, w- I would. Um, we still have to go to engineers. <laughs> Excuse me. We still have to go to engineers uh, when we build something. Um, I don't know, we've done different devices and, and mechanisms that we have to have an engineer bless it. Even in my house, when I do an addition, I have to go to an engineer and have them okay the plans. They don't do any design, but they look at it and say, yes, this is good, and they sign it off. So it's still good to have that education, but while they're off getting that education, um, I was off learning how to do it myself with my hands on. So when it's all said and done, if we have somebody come in the door and says, I need a job, and he's got experience and tools, I'll hire him in a heartbeat. If he's got a degree right. and no experience and no tools, I can't use him, no matter how many degrees he's got. So yeah. the actual the skill is becoming more valuable than the degree right now, I think. Um, the degree does pay you more when you do get the job, but there's a lot of degreed engineers out there that can't get a job anywhere. So um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's a toss-up. It's changing right now. Experience is really paying off and knowing how to use tools. Well, it is changing, and I think it's a bit of a, a, a reverse swing on the pendulum in the sense that uh, a stat that I heard was that at the peak of of this last recession that we all went through, starting in late 07, going through 08, was that at the peak of the recession, there were something like 50,000 skilled trades jobs, as our uh, leaders like to say, shovel-ready jobs, uh, that were available that could not be filled by American hands. And during that recession, people were imported from all over the world to fill these positions. And and to me, that's that's a giant exclamation point and that needs to be paid attention to. So anyway, um, not to get on a, on a rant or anything like that, but, but skilled trades are important. And, and I've always said that there is absolutely no shame in doing work with our hands. No. Uh, I can change into a white shirt when I go out to eat with my wife, but when I'm in the shop... I'm not afraid to get dirt under my fingernails because, you know, like my old man said, I'll never be without a job if I want to go into auto, the auto body trade. So I, I want people to to realize that you can make a nice living uh, without having a, a, a like a, a double bachelor's and with a focus in political science. And I'm not making fun of that. Please don't get me wrong. But uh, it, you are the quintessential example of somebody that is a self-made person that um, that did it on their own. So uh, this and, and you're not the only one. There's lots of people that have done this, and I think the focus needs to be put back on that to a certain extent. Anyway, enough <laughs> ranting on my. It's the whole show in <laughs> itself, like you said. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well. As you know, uh, Shop Talk is sponsored by the Eastwood Company, and I'm working closely with Eastwood on a lot of stuff that I find very exciting. Um, you have also an association with the Eastwood Company. As a matter of fact, one of the tools you, de- you designed for them, I'm staring at in my shop. Um, tell me about your association with Eastwood. Okay, um, I've been buying Eastwood tools as long as I can remember, and uh, they always carried unique stuff that nobody else seemed to have, and they were, um, they were, fairly, they were good quality tools. But what I liked about it was if you couldn't find it anywhere else, Eastwood had it. And I called yeah. him up one day and I said, uh, I think you're looking at the same tool I'm talking about. Um, I called him up one day and said, I need an English wheel. I'm going to start shaping some metal for a project. And I'm pretty sure they said, we don't have one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they said, I think they had the English wheel, but they didn't have a planishing hammer. Or they did, had a planishing hammer, didn't have any. Anyway, they didn't have one of them. So I said, well, um, why don't you sell me the English wheel, and I'll make a planishing hammer out of it. And one of the guys there, I think it was Joe Richardson, says, you can do that? And I go, oh, yeah, no problem. So they sent me one, and I made a planishing hammer out of it, and they asked for photos. I showed it to them. Next thing you know, they wanted um, me to start building them for them. So we started manufacturing for them. And what I did, which was funny, was I did the frame, the C-shaped frame, for a planishing hammer and an English wheel where you can convert it back and forth. So you can take the frame, nice. add the planishing hammer or the English wheel. And to make it simple for photos, I put two of them on a, a rack together and photographed it. Yeah. So then everybody started ordering the set. So it, it doubled their sales. And for a while, we were making hundreds of those things for them. And it did yeah. real well. I think it launched a lot well, of the you know new planishing hammer English wheels that people are making now. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think a lot of people have monkeyed your design, and and uh, that's a, that's a backhanded compliment in itself. But but for me, that tool serves a very specific purpose. I do have a larger English wheel, but that one is bench top, and my planishing hammer is bench top. Let's face it, we're not all making roof skins or door door skins on on cars, and and a smaller wheel with good feedback uh, is is. It's pretty essential in in any kind of a fab shop. So, um, again, thanks. Saying it out loud, I appreciate the tool. I had no idea that you uh, that you created it. Uh, of course, with with the Eastwood guys, but um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's a necessity in my shop, and I think they still sell it, don't they? 
I think they do. I'm not sure. I think it's changed. They've got somebody else manufacturing now. It's a little bit different, but it's the same principle. Um, and one of the big things with English wheel, which I'd like to mention, is a lot of people think you put a piece of metal, roll it through once, and you have a compound curve. And, and they tighten it up and they over-tighten them on any of those. You don't want to do that. You just want to slowly shape the, the metal. So you want to keep a little bit of pressure on it, not a lot. And that's the biggest yeah. thing that I find. They say, oh, you know, I ran it through once and it didn't work. Well, run it through 20 times or 100 times. But no, I've got one of my favorite quotes from Ron Covell is that we're communicating with our with our metal yeah. and we're asking it what we want. To, we're asking it nicely to do what we want it to do. We're not telling it forcefully, and and I think that's a beautiful analogy, and and that speaks exactly to what you just said. Yeah, people nowadays are in a rush. They want everything instant, instant copy, instant this, instant that. On metal, it doesn't work that way. It takes a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're talking with Eddie Paul, uh, epindustries.com and eddiepaulstooltalk.com. Let's talk about Tool Talk. What brought this radio show into existence for you? Like you don't have enough to do. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you want to do a radio talk show? Well, it's funny. I, I learned a long, long time ago. I, I took a class in video, and I, my background is film. I worked with Universal and a lot of studios for a long time. Um, I realized that when I bring in a new employee, which is usually totally – uneducated on shaping metal or welding or anything. They just come in out of school and they don't know how to do anything. So we have to go from the ground floor up, teach them how to do stuff, and you can't pay them a lot because you're training them. They're taking our time and then we have to pay them to listen to us, which is kind of weird. Um, but as soon as they get educated on how to use their hands and shape metal, they quit and they go somewhere else to get more money. And you can't blame them. But I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm spending my time, then I get them to the point they can go somewhere else and get a job. So I came up with the idea of doing videos, how-to videos. I started um, doing like how to shape metal, how to do lead work, how to do paint. They were basically a tool that I would give to a new employee when he came in, came in, and I'd say, take this home, watch this tonight and tomorrow. I expect you to know how to do it. And it worked. So we started, uh, I think we've got 20, 30 how-to DVDs right now that were meant for employees. And then they started selling them to the public, and we sold thousands. Eastwood used to handle them for a long time. Um, Anyway, it went from that to books. I've written, I think, 10 books on how to do stuff, but it was mainly to teach people, and that's what Tool Talk is. We came up with this idea on the radio where we'll start talking about tools, how to use tools, and it's, going to, it's a podcast, so we're going to eventually start, I think next week, start shooting it and adding video to it and then bring in people. Um, you know, we had uh, Bernard from Jay Leno's in here, a lot of different people, Ron Covell. Uh, we're going to have yeah. you on there. We'll just talk about tools and how to use them. And we're hoping and it, it inspires kids to learn how to, to do stuff and find out it's fun to build something. Um, I have yeah, a real quick isn't, short story. You got a second? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, go for it. When I was young, um, real young, I went to my dad one day and Popular Mechanics came out and had a picture of a mini bike on the cover. And I walked up and I knew he built things because I used to help him at his shop a little bit, doing a little stuff. And I showed it to him. I said, Dad, I want this. And he goes, what, the magazine? You already got it. I go, no, 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 the mini bike on the cover. I want this mini bike really, really bad. And he goes, okay, let me see what I can do. And anyway, it sat on his desk for the longest time, and I'd be working in the shop, sweeping up and stuff. So anyway, I w he said, uh, you want that mini bike? I go, yeah. He says, come on down to the shop. I've got a surprise for you. I go down to the shop with him and walked in the office, and there's a bunch of metal on the ground and an uh, arc welder, a little Lincoln arc welder next to it. And go, there it is. I go, yeah, that's metal on an arc welder. He goes, yes, it is. He says, and here's the blueprints. So hand it to me. He said, build it. <laughs> I love it. I was really That's disappointed, awesome. but uh, and I was ticked. <laughs> Anyways, I picked up metal cut it, and he helped me all along the way. But I built the mini bike, and I never liked anything as much as that mini bike because I had so much time into it, and it taught me something. It was really neat. I had pride well, when some kid on the street would say, "Wow, where'd you get that?" I go, "Built it." <laughs> it just felt exactly. good. What a fantastic story, man, and, and how cool that is to bond with your dad like that. I mean, you know, lots of kids have great father-son stories and relationships, and, and, but, but what great lessons, you know, and how fantastic it must have been to have, to have an old man like that that would, that would take the time in, in not just stroking a check and buying you what you wanted, but, but saw the value in, in having you create it. That's, that's a great story, dude. Yeah, well, it taught me, too, that, you know, if you want something bad enough and you can't get it, you can build it. You can build almost anything. We're building a Duesenberg right now for a customer. I built my own house. I've got a pretty good-sized yeah. house that started out 800 square feet. I think it's uh, 4,500 square feet now. We built everything in it. We did the flooring. We did the drywall. There's nothing you can't learn how to do, and there's tools out there to do all of it with. And one of the things we push is the fact that almost anything you do, if you want to chop a top on a car, you can buy all the equipment, do the chop top, 
And when you're done, it's cheaper than if you paid someone else to do it. And when you're done, you have the tools to do it again if you want to. So everything well, I do, I try to, you know, buy the equipment I need to do it with. And next time you use the equipment, the equipment is free. So you can actually well, build a shop pretty easily. When I'm coaching somebody through a paint job, I also have instructional DVDs in a series that focuses on fundamentals of basic auto body prep, some welding panel replacement, uh, blocking, and, and just the fundamentals. And when I'm coaching somebody through a paint job for the first time, what I say to them when they're intimidated, because typically guys are, I don't want to screw this up, I don't want to screw this up, but I can't afford to farm it out. I always tell people that they can screw it up three times and on the fourth time get it right and still come out cheaper than if they had dropped it off at some shop for an extended amount of time. And the added bonus of that is that they've now given themselves uh, some confidence and a new skill set that they can take any direction they want to go. And that's the power of of helping and mentoring people and, and, and creating the videos that you've created and the books and, and uh, Eddie Paul's Tool Talk. Uh, you know, we can... We can tr pass these skills on to people, and it's so vitally important that we do because we all had mentors. You had mentors, your father. I'm sure many people through the doors. I've talked to, to a lot of people when I do the, the uh, shop talk show and in my experience that, that um, have crystal clear uh, recollection of people that were instrumental in their lives and passing these skills on to them. And I think it's a huge responsibility for guys like you and me to, to take what we've learned from other people and pass it on as well. So uh, uh, applaud you big time for the, for the instructional videos. Where would people find some of these videos if they wanted to, uh, to buy some of your instructional products? Well, um, right now I think they'd have to go to our website at epindustries.com, but <clears throat> we're talking to Eastwood about picking them up again, and they sent a letter and asked for prices, so it may still be available through Eastwood. We'll find out, or you'll know before Very I cool. do, probably. <laughs> could be, could be. Well, Eastwood has been a fantastic partner for me, uh, you know, distributing my, my DVDs and my, my line of, of uh of instructional products, and, and we're working on some neat stuff. Um, I finally got a patent on a, on a hand tool that I'm working on, and, and I'd love to talk to you about that on the, on the Tool Talk show. And, and um, I don't know, it's, it's just an interesting thing. I'm looking around my shop, Eddie, and um, I've got about probably 2,200, 2,300 square feet here. It's a nice little setup that doubles as a studio for me. Um, your shop is a little different. 25,000 square feet. Uh, Lord knows how many tools, 15 CNC mills. Tell me about your shop and why in the heck do you need a, a, a city block for, <laughs> full of covered shop space? You know what's funny, too, is if I walk out in the shop right now, it's hard to get through the shop. It really is. We have little aisleways because it's so crowded. But we work on a lot of projects. And, and like I said before, I, I hardly turn anything down. If it's over my head, I'll turn it down. But most of the stuff isn't. So we're working on... Well, right now we're building some fire pumps because I have a patented fire pump, so we're building, I think, six or seven of those for the Department of Forestry. Uh, we're doing aerospace work for a company over here. We do machine work. We do CNC. We do people come up with patents, and we build the prototypes for them. We're building, I mentioned the Duesenberg out there, 30s Duesenberg. I had a Model T going. Um, we're building up as a hot rod. I've got a motorcycle. I'm getting ready for a show up in Canada in May. It's a three wheels, 502 Chevy powered um, supercharged engine. And you sit in front of the engine instead of behind it. It's got two wheels in front, one in back. Uh, it's going to have machine guns mounted on it. We've got um, the GTO from Triple X. I just finished um, restoring that. I've got a 36 rolls uh, uh, Phantom that we just restored for a company. So we're doing a lot of different things. And so we need a lot of room and a lot of different tools. We do plasma cutting, vacuum forming, you name it. Uh, we even cast the rubber pedals like the gas pedal for the Duesenberg. You can't buy them, so we designed it. Made the tool have you got one of the 3D printers in your shop? I don't have one of those. Um, I have a 3D. What do you think about that technology? It's kind of cool. It, I think it's in its infancy, and I purposely didn't get one because they're not expensive. You can easily buy one, but it's it's electronics, and electronics scare me because, like a cell phone, as soon as you buy it, it's almost outdated, or you have to upgrade it. And it's the right, same thing right. with the printers. As soon as I buy one, I know there'll be one twice as big for half the price. So I think I've been holding off, but they are neat, I, and they're neat for certain things. But for what we do, most stuff we do is made out of metal, and you can't really print metal at a low cost yet. No. But I think the best application I've seen for a 3D printer is a guy that was – it was actually on a TV show. He was doing motorcycle parts, like a swing arm, and, and he did it on a, a 3D printer 
Uh, it created a CAD file. He tested it out on his on his motorcycle, and then he threw the CAD file into his CNC and milled it out of aluminum. So for that purpose, I think you know, and it was cradle to grave within uh, a couple of hours. Oh yeah. So. It, that to me was a really interesting uh, use of that technology. I'm like you, uh, you know, I um, knee deep in the the television world and production and video equipment and all that kind of stuff, and it changes faster than you could ever keep up with buying this stuff. And so it's just it's it's just sort of a necessary evil to to dabble your foot into it and spend some money every once in a while. I just didn't know with all the uh, all the equipment that you've had and everything at your disposal uh, whether whether that was something that you, you utilized or not. But uh, it sounds like maybe in the not-too-distant future you will be. Maybe. And, again, uh, that's something that so many people have, and I may just farm that out. Cause as an example, I, I was a keynote speaker for Autodesk in Las Vegas a few years back. And for the event, I talked about how we make sharks um, using AutoCAD and how we design them and things. We make a mechanical swimming shark that's been used in a lot of films. Um, as, a, as a gift, they printed out a great white shark for me that was, I believe, it was seven feet long, all printed and gave it to me as a, a gift when they were done, when I was done with the keynote speaking. Anyway, I brought it back to the shop sitting out there. I found out later it cost them $150,000 to print that. I could have Ouch. printed that in my shop in half the time for a tenth of that price. So that's just an example of how expensive it was when it first started. And, and that yeah. big piece had to be made in sections and put together. Uh, I appreciate the gift, but there was a cheaper way to do it at the time. And that's what kind of scared me because I keep thinking, well, you know, maybe 20 years down the the road, 3D printing will be the in thing. And for some people, it's in now. You can make – we do little tiny prototypes we haven't printed. But it's so easy to just call someone and say, here's the file, the DXF, print this. So it's something that takes space. And, and Jay Leno's got one down in his shop. And they use it for making dash knobs and little stuff. But right now, I don't know anybody who's taking it real serious and making products with it. So I think it's still in its infancy. So you've got to tell us how you got involved with the Cousteau Dive Teams and that whole organization. Yeah, that was kind of a weird one. Um, like I say, every, I never know what I'm doing next week until the phone rings. Somebody calls, hey, can you do this? It was one of those days where I was working on, um, I think I was doing documentaries for Discovery at the time, doing a little stuff for them, little props. And the phone rang, and this guy calls me. His name was Steve Arrington. He's a chief diver for Cousteau's in Hollywood because they had an office out here for a while. And he goes, I'd like you to make a tripod, 30-foot tripod for us. We're going to do an underwater shot. We can't find an underwater tripod. So that was easy. So I built that. And then when he found out I could build, um, he asked me if I'd come out on an expedition with him and help him set the thing up and do these, you know, other little projects for him. And I love to. And I love the Cousteau's, too. And I mean, to actually get invited to go out with him, um, it was quite an honor. So I took some time off, went out. Had a ball. The guys were all great. I mean, it's like a party every day, just, you know, people laughing and playing jokes on each other. And it was just fun. Then you mix it in with some danger with sharks and things. So it went from that to um, Jean-Michel, who I worked for, which was Jacques Cousteau's son. And I worked off the Alcyon, which is a wind ship. Uh, one day he asked me if I could build a shark, um, a great white shark, that they could put in the water with the great white sharks to see what it would do. And that was my first challenge. I had two weeks to do it in. I came back, built a mechanical shark that actually swam with an umbilical. Um, so the umbilical ran from the shark to a control. And when I got there, he said, well, jump in the water and operate it. So I had to jump in the water with great white sharks. We had 14 of them and operate it. I didn't know that when I built it. <laughs> it was fun. And then the shark, of course, mine was 10 feet long. And the one that came up that ate it was 17 feet long. So it tore it to shreds. And we got it all on camera, which is what they wanted. So it worked out really good. Now, arguably, everybody on the planet has seen the film Jaws. And for the time, it was state-of-the-art animatronics and premier quality filmmaking. But now, in comparison, it, it kind of looks fakey. So how, how did the sharks react to your shark? You know, we're not sure. Um, we put it in the water, and the sharks actually ignored it for a long time, and then started swimming with it. And mine became the dominant shark, which we didn't understand why. And Cousteau's is... It's not as much research as it is a film company. They like things that look neat, and, and there is some research, and they bring you know marine biologists out. But nobody there knew. So finally, we tried. We wanted to up the action because swimming next to our shark was nothing. So we put um, we put some chum in it. That didn't seem to help a lot. We put blood in it. That helped a little. But I started making a swim erratic, like it was injured, and that's when the shark came in, just tore it to shreds. So we actually think it was a mercy killing that it thought you know one of its kind was dying and took it out. Um, that's the only thing that really made any sense. But it was really kind of neat to see and hear because underwater, you know, people don't realize you can hear stuff. 
So when that big shark bit into mine, mine was made of Lexan, stainless, and skin flex. And you could hear the it sounded like bones crushing when the shark bit into it. It was really eerie. And then the shark would swim off, spit the pieces out. They they throw them up if they don't agree with them. And came back and bit it over and over and over. So it was a uh, beat to see. <laughs> And then later, uh, years later, Jean, uh, Jean-Michel had a son, Fabian Cousteau, who came back, wanted to be build another shark for a CBS show, and he wanted to be inside the shark when it gets attacked. So we did that for him. Made that air-powered so it didn't have an umbilical. It was all self-controlled or self-sustaining. And that was a challenge. We had to, um, about a month to build that one in. But with him inside, it was a real, you know, dangerous. So we had to build that out of a stainless steel roll cage. Made the whole thing with ribs where it would flex back and forth. And they, they swam by moving their tail back and forth. How unique, huh? Just like fish. <laughs> We're just happy nature. Well, tell me how you got involved in, in the motion pictures in the first place. Because, you know, you can't just go up to the front gate of Universal Studios and say, I want to make some cars for your movies. Yeah, like you say, you can't go there and knock on the door and say, I'd like to do it. They just ignore you, slam the door in your face. Um, I had a little shop that I started in El Segundo because I was working out of my garage for a long time. And the neighbors were complaining about the noise because I'm banging metal. So I had to move out, so I rented a shop to finish one of my projects in El Segundo. A small shop, went in there, and I was working on my car, my wife and I, uh, trying to finish it up. We were going to be in and out in a month. And then uh, this guy knocked on the door. I thought it was from the city, complaining. Um, I opened the door, and the guy came in and says, yeah, I'm from a studio, and we'd like to know if you could build 48 cars in two weeks for us for a movie called Grease. And at, at the time, you know, everybody knows what Grease is. Back then, I was like, Grease? It sounds like a cooking show. And he goes, John Travolta, and I had no idea who John Travolta was. I didn't watch TV. Um, so I go, yeah, we can do that. And, and that was what always gets me in trouble. I say, sure, no problem. And then I look at it later and I go, wow, this is a problem. But um, he came in and I, I said, yeah, we can do it. i got to finish my car first because you don't understand. This is a hurry. He put a briefcase on my desk, opened it up, turned it around, and it was full of money. I just looked at the money and go, sure, no problem at all. And when do you need him? Two weeks. So we did it. And that's what got us started because name got out then. He would pass out the name to other people and say, this guy built cars for me. If you need them, um, give him a call. And just went on. I was doing five or six shows at the same time. We got a bigger shop, hired more people, um, just grew from there. Well, obviously, you get a lot done in a short amount of time. Have you got any advice for somebody like me that's maybe a little unorganized and just as driven? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think you got to be deadline driven. I, I realized a long time ago, you give somebody a million dollars and no deadline and a project, and the project will never be done. It'll be late. But if you give somebody two weeks, something ridiculous, and a certain amount of money, it'll get done. And I don't know why that is, but I do the same thing. If I set a deadline that's got to be done by Friday, it will be done by Friday. Um, but, yeah, that's the one thing, you know, a lot of companies don't give you is an absolute extreme deadline and a budget to work off of because you kind of work backwards. You know it's got to be done this Friday, and you know you only have this much money, and you work backwards. Where otherwise, you just keep working, keep taking money. It's become, you know, welfare. <laughs> Well, what's new with you? What have you got coming up, Eddie? Well, we just finished Shark Week. We did some stuff for that. It'll be out. That's uh, the guy that does Air Jaws, Jeff Kerr. We do stuff for him. We make mechanical sharks, mechanical seals. We did a lot of stuff on that show. We just sent out. He's filming it now. The biggest thing is I'm co-producing a show with my wife um, with another group out of Australia. It's going to be called The Mystery Wreck of Micronesia, and it's a ship that we discovered 22 years ago when we were diving in um, one of the islands off of Truck. And we found a, a Japanese ship that we think has plutonium in it. So we're going to do a whole documentary on it. We got funding. It just got greenlit, so we're going to go do that. And what we had to do is take a um, – we had to sneak a Geiger counter into a, a housing and make it look like a camera so we could take it down and check for radiation levels and things. But that's going to be kind of fun because it's a, a documentary. I love those. And we're going to keep it as factual as possible. And we think if this had plutonium, it's going to change history because that means the, the Japanese were – close to building a bomb, a lot closer than we thought. So it takes away a lot of the guilt from World War II. Now, I didn't know this, but you were actually involved in the original Gone in 60 Seconds movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, Toby Halkey, he was a friend of mine. Yeah, I worked on that, and he did about five shows that people don't know about. And he died on the last one. He was doing uh, Gone in 60 Seconds Part Two, where the water tower fell and landed on him. That was back in Buffalo, New York. Uh, yeah, I was a stunt coordinator on a lot of his shows. I wasn't there when he died. I quit five days before it because he was getting too reckless. And I told him, I said, you know, if you don't watch it, you're going to kill yourself. And five days later, he did. Oh, man, what a great legacy to be a part of. It must be such a, a fun thing to be a part of. Yeah, it is fun. It, it's kind of an example, like you said, too. Um, you know, he wasn't a filmmaker. He was absolutely you not. Know, he, he was a car thief in the beginning. He actually stole cars in a movie based on his true life experiences. 
And then he got into the junkyard and working on cars. But nobody could tell him no. If you tell him you can't do something, he'd do it. And that's you got you got to do that. You can't tell have people say that can't be done. And then you do it, and you you prove to him it can be done. Um, yeah, uh, everybody will tell you something can't be done. It's too hard. It's too complicated. If you listen to him, you're already beat. So yeah, that was an inspiration just seeing him do the impossible all the time. And, uh, and in fact, we had a, a real funny story. Later on, he stopped doing his own stunts because he got hurt. He did a lot of the driving in the original gun of 60 seconds. He broke his back. On. Yeah. And he broke his back and wouldn't go to the hospital. He was too stubborn. He cracked some vertebrae and then he kind of powered through the show. Um, later on, another show, he brought in, he thought, well, I'm doing, you know, I've done four or five movies now. I need to hire people to do this stuff. So he brought some stuntmen in from Hollywood. And he, I was there when he was telling them, so well, I want you to take this Cadillac, jump up on that ridge, spin it around, flip over here and do this. And he looked at it and goes, Toby, that can't be done. He goes, yes, it can. And anyway, he got a little argument with him. He said, watch, I'll show you how. And he got in the car and did exactly what he told them to do, landed it. And he was just sitting, standing there with their mouths open. And he turned around and fired him and said, you can't do it. I don't need you. So he went in and did the stunt himself. He was an amazing driver. Excuse <coughs> me. But, yeah, he's one of those people you just do not say no to. Well, throw us out some names of people that have been iconic in your life and, and have been inspiration and mentors to you. Well, Ed Roth, I met him when I was young, went to a shop in Maywood. Uh, that was an inspiration. And uh, when I got my shop going, I used to hire him. He'd come over and pinstripe almost everything we did. Um, he was a real big inspiration. And, of course, he was a builder. <clears throat> There's a lot of them. It's almost too numerous to mention. Uh, Jean-Michel was an inspiration. Uh, of course, Jacques Cousteau. Uh, Lyle Wagner. A lot of people don't know he was mechanical. He um, built a car for him. He introduced me to Toby Hallecky, in fact. But, um, yeah, he used to come by the shop and just hang out and he'd carve things out of wood. A really talented guy. Um, Jay Leno. I mean, he's one of my favorites. He's, uh, of course, got a giant car collection. He's in the and um, all those guys down there, Bernard and Jim, and I go down a lot of times just talk, hang out, watch what they're doing, and they tell me about the latest tool. I tell them what I've got, and we trade information. So, um, God, it's, like I said, it's almost too many to, to mention. Well, Eddie, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day. This was fascinating, and uh, we're looking forward to being part of your world one of these days, too. All right. And I'll set that up with my producer probably uh, later today. I'll be in touch with you on it. It'll be fun. I like to hear all the stuff you're doing. Man, that's awesome. Well, people, we've been listening to Eddie Paul on Shop Talk, so make sure you check out Eddie Paul's Tool Talk radio show as well as the EP Industries website. There's some fascinating photos and some, a pretty good bit of Eddie's history on there. And as always, send us some email, and we're giving away prizes when we ask your questions on the air, so there's lots of stuff to win. Remember, do the job right with Eastwood. I'm Kevin Dates, and thanks for listening. We'll see you in the main room.